Hello, everybody. Uh, so welcome to the Cyber Back to School edition. This is the first time uh, uh, this is coming along. So we're excited to be part of it. Uh, we'd love to give a shout out to Dwayne uh, for giving us the opportunity to um, be part of the October Fest. As you guys all know, October is the Cybersecurity Month. Hence, we are doing this. And uh, with that being said, my name is Abdul Kazi, and I have Chris Gale here. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Hey, Abdul. Hey, everybody. Um, going well, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, super excited to uh, contribute to Cyber Back to School, for Dwayne. This is a really cool effort. Uh, I know we do a lot of like back to school other activities, but it's really nice to kind of focus on cybersecurity. Um, so, yeah, excited to bring this session to you all. Yeah, and great timing for that as well. So. Today, the topic is going to be Microsoft Defender for Cloud Overview. I know Microsoft Defender uh, encompasses a lot of things. So this one is specifically going to be cloud, although cloud is going to be like we can talk, me and do, um, uh, Chris can talk for days on this one. But, you know, it's just an <laughs> overview on this one today just to give you an overview. Uh, so before we jump into the actual meat of the presentation, let's do some intros. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, for those who don't know me, um, this is my slide. This is a little bit about me. I'm Chris Gill, um, I, you know, do a lot of different things um, over the years, but SharePoint into Azure, doing a little bit of security, bouncing all over the place. But, um, but yeah, I know the word focus on here um, is a fun one, but it's hard to focus on Azure with so many, so many different features, almost 300 of them. But um, a lot of focus in security, a lot of focus in, you know, some open AI stuff. I'm um, just happy to kind of bring this uh, to you all and bring our experience to this chat. So thank you. And Abdul, you're up. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, my name is Abdul Kazi. Um, been in the industry for quite some time now. Um, recently was awarded the MVP and I'm the co-host of Come Cloud with us with Chris. So. Anytime you're looking to speak, we're always looking for speakers. Doesn't matter if you're a newbie or you're a seasoned one, you know, uh, give us a shout out. We're happy to have you on. Um, and, and the topics vary, so it's not specific to any topics, any, anything cloud related. So that would be awesome. Um, so then, yeah, let's get right into it. So before we jump into the actual um, talking about Defender for Cloud, right? Uh, cloud. Security is really a hot topic now. We've been hearing about ransomware. We've been hearing about a lot of things. Um, I, I guess the biggest one you want to kind of call out, or I, I would call out, is uh, 23andMe. Uh, so you know that that's uh, a good one to call out right now. People are kind of freaking out because their DNAs and whatnot are going to be there. People have no idea, and they're like, "Oh, can I even?" um requested lead by things so yeah security is really uh top of mind and then i don't know chris if you've heard but october microsoft is turning on the mfas or you know wait what <laughs> this october like this year <laughs> yeah um yes, i know there may be a little bit of a fake surprise but hey you know october 14th please 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 if you don't and if you haven't um take a look at what microsoft has published out there's a lot of a lot of information, a lot of resource, but they are Microsoft managed policies. They're enforcing MFA for every tenant for pretty much everyone. So um, there are some caveats, some things, but a lot of, um, you know, a lot of T's to cross and I's to dot there. So please check that out. Um, you know, reach out if you have any questions, either one of us happy to point you in the right direction, um, you know, work with you to, to kind of get you going on that. But yeah, good one. Good call. Out. Yeah. So, so talk about that, right? So and we live in the cloud world now. So you might say, hey, yeah. I, my company is hybrid. Yes, your company might be hybrid. You might have a lot of on-prem workloads, but you are going to be facing, interfacing with the cloud at some point, right? Look, your workload. So your virtual machines, your uh, networking um, resources, a lot of things are going to be in the cloud. And honestly, it doesn't matter which cloud you are, public cloud, Microsoft, Google, AWS. Uh, you know, you have to secure your environment. And we've seen exploitations where you it was not properly secured and then the data is gonna leak. Plus, depending on where you stand, if you are in a 
uh, regulated industry like finance or public sector. Now you have to go through those compliances as well. So this is going to be absolutely crucial for you guys from a security aspect. So yeah, uh, security is critical. So let's go to the next slide. Sure. And from a cloud security and protection needs, we're like we've actually kind of talking about or hearing DevOps quite a bit now. So uh, really develop, you know, development security operations that are what me it means. And then because uh, people like, oh, Dev, uh, DevSecOps, Dev, DevSecOps. I'm like, what exactly is that? So I kind of had to look that up, but I'm like, yeah, that's development security operations. Um, that really unifies security management at the code level, right? Because uh, code level across multiple cloud, as I mentioned, people are doing multiple cloud. You might um, not be just in Azure. You might have AWS, GCP, because different workloads, different um, needs. Because each right. cloud is, has its own unique uh, niche as well. So that's something as well. And you might have multiple pipeline environments as well. So DevSecOps fits right in there perfectly, right? Uh, and the culture, you need the cult culture, cloud security posture management. So how are you going to control this? Uh, you need to look at this from one pane of glass and say, okay, how does my security look like today? You know, um, what are the issues? What are the challenges? What do I need to remediate? So that actually has to be uh, top of mind as well. Um, so yeah, I can go in and on, on, on this one, but I think the point is um, all of these network security, cloud infrastructure, cloud workload, you need to start thinking about this and start planning about this as well, right? Because if you don't plan, then yeah, Nothing is going to get done. So that's one of the other things that uh, makes it interesting, in, in my opinion. And right. Abdul, the one the one thing I would add to that, um, all great points. Um, I, I always like when I get in these conversations with folks, um, you know, within industry or even in my workplace. Yeah, I always want to kind of ring true back to the this is a shared responsibility. So it's it's you know we talk about the shared responsibility model, but DevSecOps is truly that. It's like there's all these different resources in orchestrated fashion where you know multiple different departments or different parts of the infrastructure are responsible for this. So it's it's not just the security team responsibility or development team responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility. So no, that's a great point, and and I think that's what we're going to see in the next slide or maybe next couple of slides talking about. Um, the CNAP um, program. So let's, yeah, let's go to the next slide then. Yep, that's exactly it. So yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Good time. Uh, the cloud native application production platform. I know that's a mouthful to even call it out as uh, CNAP, but really what, what this is cloud, you know, cloud native application production platform is really a set of uh, security measurements and policies and practices designed to protect your cloud-based uh, applications end-to-end. -end. Um, so as you can see, we have code, compute, identity, data, and storage. So, And then if you bring it down, obviously there are three different levels uh, we can break it down. So we kind of talked about the first one, DevSecOps, which is really your security management at the code level across multiple cloud and multiple pipelines. The second one is going to be your cloud security posture management CSPM that really provides a solution or it services an action that you can to prevent breaches. Uh, so that's going to help you uh, prevent breaches, right? Like breaches are unavoidable. It is going to happen. It's not like if it's just a matter of if, right? It's not when. So that's going to happen. And then the last one is your uh, cloud workload protection platform where it specifically protects you from servers, container storage, databases, and other workloads, right? So yeah, the, this entire combination uh, is known as the cloud native application production platform. Uh, and that's where really uh, the Defender for Cloud fits in. The Defender for Cloud really integrates into the uh, cloud security posture management because you are managing, right? So. Uh, the whole idea of 
Defender from Cloud is to give you a if it is to give you visibility. It's pretty much a pane of glass to give you visibility of your environment. So that's what it does. Um, and uh, so yeah, let's go to the next slide because we, we can talk more about this in detail. So I want to I want to pause you for one second though because I like this really big blue button on here. So we can't skip over the, the generative AI button in the room, right? I know folks are seeing this saying, what do you mean by enhance with generative AI? So, you know, we think about all these AI applications that folks are building and stuff. So, you know, CNAP is super powerful and it's right, um, you know, just by itself. But now we're applying different applications that might have generative features, might be using, you know, Azure Open AI or whatever else. Um, we got to protect against those types of um, you know, we talk about SQL injection, whatever else. Now we need to worry about prompt injection and make sure that we're protecting our applications, our resources, our infrastructure against that type of attack as well. So, um, you know, enhanced with generative AI, they're becoming a little more intelligent. Um, I'd love to say that's a super intelligent feature, but it's, you know, it's as good as it can be right now. It's ever growing and ever learning. So now we can go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's actually a very good call out. So yeah, yeah. And talking, yeah, and, and I, I know this is a little busy slide as well, but then uh, talking about the CNAP capabilities for Defender for Cloud, right? Um, and then as you can see, and I kind of already mentioned that we see AWS GC, and GCP here as well. So this is a multi-cloud approach where where you can, with Microsoft Defender for Cloud, you can pretty much use it. And then also you can uh, use it with other security ops tools as well. So we can see the seam. So the seam, you know, could be um, um, the Microsoft product or you, you can bring your own, you know. So mm -hmm. depending on what people have, I, I've seen people using the native Microsoft um, tooling um, and then or you can just bring your um, third party, um, just like the firewalls, Microsoft. A lot of people want to use Microsoft. So even the networking, right? If you take a look, look at the integrated insights network segment, some people might say, yeah, Microsoft firewall is good enough, but I'll bring my own NVA. So Palo Alto mm -hmm. or not. So same thing with Seam. They might say, you know, uh, I'll bring Splunk uh, because it's, if it's an enterprise edition, they're like, yeah, you know, I don't want to use Sentinel which is Microsoft product for the same, mm -hmm. but they're like, yeah, we already have Sentinel. We're using it for AWS and whatnot. So that's the beauty of it. it, it it's not a dead end for you. People think, you know, I'm going to be stuck in the ecosystem. What's going to happen to me? But um, you have options. You can integrate yeah. And Microsoft. Actually, uh, kudos to them because they've done a phenomenal job of opening it up to integrate with other applications and and other tools to make this thing work um honestly this is a full-time job like just looking at the logs and things that are blowing up in the portal uh even in, in a small small workload so uh funny i was doing some testing in my um first like in my own um test environment and i turned it on and i like boom, I, I got a couple of notifications that these are the things that are not working. So imagine if it's a larger environment workload, like hundreds and hundreds of VMs and resources and whatnot. Yeah, you know, uh, you, you're going to be seeing a lot, a lot of alerts coming your way. Chris, mm -hmm. your thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm just thinking of the, you know, it's, eh, most of the environments I've seen, relatively small, but... Um, you know, that's, that's right now, of course, over time, they keep growing, whatever else I can imagine, you know, if folks haven't done any of this, if this is your first, you know, foray into Defender for Cloud, um, that could be overwhelming right away. And so, you know, it's a, um, you know, there's some approaches, some things where you could um, hone in and just say, here's a small subset that I want to onboard, um, you know, start working from there, instead of saying, you know, Oh, hey, I've got like 10,000 VMs and, you know, this massive environment that's cross-platform, cross-cloud, and I'm just going to turn everything up and let it go. Like, don't do that. Try not to do that um, because you're right. It's a bunch of bells, a bunch of whistles are going to ring. If folks are using, you know, Sentinel or some other SIM environment, 
um, or other integrations. It's like that's gonna it's gonna be a, a little bit of a reversal of fortune. So it won't be uh, in your favor by turning that stuff up for everything right at the beginning. But um, that's actually a good point, actually. Yeah, don't turn everything on because yeah, you'll get a lot of security alerts off the bat. Obviously, there's going to be scoring as well. So uh, even depending on the subscription you get yeah. on the Azure subscription, you might get, oh, th these are the, because it provides you a number, right? Scoring, so the scoring, yeah. based on the scoring, you, you'll have to go look at the environment. So yeah, don't, I would say, keep it simple, start small and then see how it looks like, because, you know, when, once you open it up, uh, the floodgates are gonna open up more, depending on the inventory you have, the workbooks you have, uh, and then you can obviously go in Look at the Cloud Security Explorer, which gives you a better overview of things, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, again, this is really an overview. We don't want to go into the details and then the nitty-gritty of it. But, uh, yeah, that's for another session. But just to give you an idea, right? Yeah. And I, the only other thought um, that I would add, too, is just that, at least uh, you know, my experience with Defender for Cloud is, I know there's a lot of information on these slides, even though it's more of an intro, but the unified approach to this is is just surreal too, where, you know, been used to different portals, different environments. Um, some of that is now truly unified in one spot. So we're getting closer to the single pane of glass. I don't know that we'll, I ever hit that mark, but, um, but we're seeing that with, at least with Defender for Cloud, where a lot of the signals coming in from other sources, maybe Intune, maybe, you know, M365 environment, your server infrastructure, whatever it might be, um, you know, different bits and pieces are all kind of funneled into that one spot. So really nice, um, closer to the one-stop shop. Um, all yeah, right. And then we kind of touched about this a little bit, but then, you know, it's the multi-cloud and hybrid support approach uh, because nobody, even if you're born in the cloud, so people might say, you know, I really have a brownfield environment or greenfield environment, meaning uh, I was born in the cloud. I don't have any on-prem. You still would require this. So uh, com coming back to my example of compliance, right, or, or regulation. So if you have a regu regulatory compliance, then yeah, uh, this does a f phenomenal job and each country actually has a different compliance so um mm. that actually is just phenomenal uh, so yeah um that i feel like that's a full-time job by itself <laughs> looking at the, uh, just keeping up with the compliance but this does a phenomenal job of that um again you can do code to cloud security so that's going to be integrating everything, right? It does risk assessment for you, and then it would take uh, required actions. So that's going to be amazing. And then the full lifecycle protection, uh, regardless of what are you doing. So what, what that really means is a lot of people now are doing everything through IAC infrastructure as code. So that makes it easier. As we said earlier, the set, the set security ops is more on the pipeline side, right? When you're developing your DevOps and doing pipelines, that what it looks like. Nobody honestly should be doing click mouse now. You shouldn't be going in the portal. I'm going to change this through, you know, mm -hmm. click off a mouse or button. Those days are over. I hope companies are not doing that way because that is prone to a lot of errors. But yeah, that's why you have the full lifecycle protection because uh, you can automate a lot of things, right? And then the advanced threat protection, um, like Chris said, AI. And AI, honestly, people might think, yeah, it's a buzzword. It is a buzzword in, in some sense, but it has a, a lot of uh, good goodies to it as well. So, and uh, there's a, talk about to uh, uh, us about the AI part of things, right? From a threat protection and um, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, well, and I, I would just say this. I mean, I know they call it out, and I think that the threat intelligence number is probably surpassed that 65 trillion signals daily. But, man, you know, um, you know, Microsoft's one of the big security players in the field, right? So they're seeing um, breaches. They're seeing some of these signals. They're taking all that information. Um, they're, you know, running it through their own DevSecOps environment finding, you know, a bunch of the stuff and rapidly trying to protect other customers, protecting their operating systems, protecting our workloads and, you know, 
hospitals or whoever else, schools um, that are, you know, just trying to do business. So um, protecting from the bad guys, but also, you know, protecting from even some of the red team stuff too um, as well. But, but yeah, um, the AI advancement in this area, it's wild to see, um, you know, from a natural language perspective that now, you know, as Abdul and I are sitting here talking about, you know, uh, hey, you know, I saw this thing in the environment and, you know, uh, like I could go to my team or, or Abdul or anybody else and say, can we track this down? How do I, you know, where do I start? Where do I go? I don't have to necessarily reach out to someone. I can start in the, this generative AI approach using, you know, security and natural language context to say, can you go find this thing for me in the environment? Can you build a KQL query or whatever it might be to find this? Um, can you maybe react to this? If I saw something on a device, go ahead and, you know, your mileage may vary, but I could recommend to this set of three devices that I saw some breach and, you know, I had a Sentinel alarm that popped up and I said, go ahead and, you know, network quarantine these devices. Um, something I could do and I could do pretty quickly before, I, like to your point, I could go and click around. That might take me 15 or 20 minutes. Guess what? That's 15 or 20 minutes that, you know, your environment or your devices or your data might be in the hands of somebody you don't want it to be in. So um, if I can go out and get a response and ask a question in natural language um, and have that thing just done, or at least come back to me for approval and then say, yeah, let's go ahead and do the thing. Um, that's huge. And that's time saved. That's time, you know, money saved. That's, um, you know, data saved. So really cool features. Oh, that, that's a great point. That's a great point. All right. Moving on. So yeah, uh, strength of security from the start, right? Like, as we said, there's Microsoft security. So it shows a security score, but there's also, uh, so security score is basically part of the security posture and security <laughs> posture also shows you the recommendations of, you know, what, what is it recommending and then um, anything overdue or anything unassigned. And then it, the security posture as you can, or security score as you can see is showing across multiple clouds. So it, Azure, AWS, and GCP. And you're like, yeah, you know, really, we got to go and fix this. And then the other good thing is it also, <coughs> excuse me, shows you um, when you go into the Microsoft Cloud Defender overview pane uh, mm -hmm. in the Azure portal or the Android portal. Uh, it also shows the regulatory compliance. So you might say, yeah, you know, uh, obviously Azure security has its own benchmark that is, that it's basically benching you again. So your environment is going to be judged against that. And you might, it might say, yep, you know, you pass 33 controls versus 40. So it might say, yep, you know, your PCI compliance is half ready, half baked, half done. There are issues with that. Uh, there's SOC compliance, depending on if you let's say SOC 2, um, you need more remediation on the SOC piece side of things. Uh, and as you can say, these are all the things that it evaluates. So if that's access, compute, uh, SQL Server, IO, uh, IoT networking, apps, containers, and uh, um, Azure API management. So these are like more, it all does more, but these are things that really are going to be called out uh, from an access because, again, as we started to do um, talking in our um, um, introduction, right? about access you really want to basically make sure that access is limited so and that all boils down to subscription because people who have access to subscription can view the kingdom right so let's say if you become somebody an owner then that's pretty much a problem um if they really need a contributor role so do not provide them with an owner role right um so I, I'm still seeing a lot of people do that, but like, yeah, you know, I need to fix something rather than go and use the custom role. They're like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just make myself owner and then they forget about it and then something happens. So that's how the breaches happen. You have to be careful with those things. So, um, but yeah, um, just standard practices, um, the least privilege, and then start looking at uh, the roles start looking at the workloads you might have uh, quite a bit of workloads like chris said like thousands or hundreds of vms and that workload is going to basically have a score uh based on the coverage and the resources and then you can come back and say you know 
alerts are by severity and then why why is what, what's with the high ones like the 80 90 um uh, high high ones you can might say yeah you know uh let's take a look are they out of band meaning the, they're out of compliance because they don't have updated patches or there's something new or those kind of things right so the, yeah uh, sometimes i feel like we're getting information overload but uh, <laughs> that's the nature of the beast uh, right well yeah, and I would just, I mean, folks that know me well know that I love to talk about policy. So whether it's, you know, the, the traditional group policy or Azure policy or any of this other stuff, a lot of this is kind of baked in behind this this slide, right? Um, so we talk about like the 450 out-of-the-box recommendations. Yeah, there's, there's a ton. It's going to come through and blow through and check through your environment. A lot of the things you may not be using that resource. So, you know, it'll skip over that. It'll say, all right, if I have... Um, I don't know, one of my favorites, I'll pick on Azure Key Vault. So fine, I set up Azure Key Vault, great. I did this thing, I went through and did the UI. Sorry, Abdul, I used the UI, clicked a bunch of buttons, made something happen. Well, guess what? I probably didn't set up any kind of like diagnostic logging. So I'm probably not sending stuff, you know, or keeping retention policies or any other stuff. The beauty of this product <clears throat> in this approach is I go out and find recommendations, not only from Microsoft, but like you said, the industry standard stuff. So maybe ISO 27001, right? Or some other, uh, you know, HIPAA requirements. Um, make sure that I'm doing the right stuff. But I can also not only just have it record, I can actually tell it, go ahead and fix the configuration SKU too. So we can work through policy or uh, now I believe deployment stacks, right? So deployment stacks is a thing. I know a little bit deeper, but um, just kind of circling that back through is, you know, as you're kind of learning about this all and seeing some of the related um, information and products out there, that's kind of how you help address and strengthen that security um, from the start, but also through the life cycle. So, great, great right. point. Great point. Ah. Cutting through all the noise like we were talking through before. We turn this on, we get all kind of notifications. Now what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know th that's the biggest challenge now. People will sometimes get overwhelmed, and they might say, "Hey, I'm going to shut this off because this is getting too much, too many notifications, and too much distractions." But that's why I said, you know, you have to take it easy. You have to start small, and then um, go from there. And the beauty is some of them are agentless um, protection as well. So uh, depending on your policy, you can uh, push it out through Intune or group policy and whatnot. Like, you know, depending on what mechanism you're using, but yeah, uh, start small and, and be cognizant that this is gonna uh, blow up fairly quickly. So ha have a game plan in there. And I would just pick on because I know folks always pick on me for the the billions and billions of like Microsoft acronyms and stuff. So you might be wondering, like, if you draw your eyes to the right hand side and see EASM, and wonder what 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 is that? Well, it's an external attack surface management. So if there's something that's unmanaged outside of your environment that might be you know trying to pry and poke in or whatever else, um, consider EASM. So. Just in case anyone is curious there, I know we covered some of these other ones, but I like to call those out. Uh, not fair. And even I had to look it up recently. So <laughs> we've yeah. all been there. That's a good call out because I know a lot, a lot of acronyms we become used to and we just throw the acronyms out and we don't even, people don't know. Yeah. So that's a good call out. Um, but yeah, I guess next let's. Um, yeah, we, we kind of already talked about this. So I, I don't think we're going to go much into detail in that one. But, you know, from a depth of security, then, yeah, Microsoft actually does a great job on the GitHub and uh, Azure DevOps and GitLab, you know. So mm -hmm. then again, you integrate all of that into your uh, development and boom, you pretty much have it covered, right? Like I was saying about talking about automation and then pipelines, getting everything together. So it, it kind of goes hand to hand hand in hand now. Right. And I always love this too, because it gives a little bit of, you know, business continuity, like a disaster recovery approach too, because if, I don't know, say something detrimental happened in the tenant or in the environment, 
fusion infrastructures code, you can usually, I'd love to say always, but you can usually, so long as nothing has changed um, with dependencies, um, just kind of press the button and say, here, redeploy this thing, right? Um, and usually magically everything just happens without you know any hiccup and it gets redeployed. So that's the goal, right? It's the goal is to get everything consistent. Um, item potent, I think is one of the words. So it's like, it always is true. It always follows what you told it to do. Um, people don't do that usually, but you know, our code should follow suit. So good one. All right. Oh, software development life cycle, SDLC. Come on, Abdul, talk about SDLC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about this one, right? Like, I, I, I know we're really getting into the weeds of that, but just to give you an overview of, on the security side, so Defender for Cloud, we kind of talked about in the previous slide that really covers the DevOps, you know, security insights. Um, you can do pipelines and then even development you got to have the code there uh, because from a developer standpoint, all the uh, automate, all the remediation should be automated now, like, or at least planned to be. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that's the direction. And that's actually a bridging gap, if you will. Now, if you look before, you know, everything was done manual, then yeah, we'll get that fixed. But yeah, everything is pretty much automated through uh, IAC infrastructure as code. Um, so it, it's going to help, um, uh, have a better security posture, if you will. Yeah. And yeah, I, <clears throat> I would just call out, I love the, the bridging um, because, you know, can we expect that all of our security folks are good with code? No, but, you know, bridging that gap of asking the right questions, having those discussions working together again, that, that you know, managed environment um, between, you know, everyone that um, just, it, it helps to kind of, you know, move this forward and make sure that it's done securely, done appropriately, and done you know based on the requirements of both teams. So. And then some of the threats and for cloud and on-prem, right? So uh, th these are pretty exploratory by itself. We're gonna not go through those, but we kind of talked about the like threat detection and response, the agentless vulnerability and assessment. Um, but th th these are basic things that it's that you would have already gone through with any other product as well. So ro rolling out Intune or other things, right? Those kind of things but when you're dealing with agents or even I'll give a perfect example is uh, in the old days we used to push out and I'm sure it happens now, antivirus, right? Antivirus mm -hmm. agents. So, um, that's how pretty much that's what it is now, right? You're trying to limit your, uh, threat surface. So that's what it is all about. How you protect that. Yeah. And I just, one call out to the, I, I love this, you know, attack story across end user assets, um, just for brief visualization. It's amazing to see like when this is up and running and in play, you can see like every path that the attacker has taken, you know, whether it's a user account, whether it's a device, whether it's an endpoint, other endpoints that were affected, you can see that entire path in that chain. So you can kind of navigate through um, and, you know, replay what happened, um, you know, and kind of uh, work forward to make sure that you can prevent it in the future, but also, you know, getting that replay is, is also important um, just to know like, what folks do you need to tell about, you know, what might've happened or what part of your you know, business or your environment may have been touched. So all good stuff. And, uh, you know, all at the click of a button. Um, we kind of talked about this, but I guess this is much more into more detail or depth about what is covered. So as we know, you know, um, if you talk about, um, cloud, you, you can pretty much put it into compute storage and networking, right? So here we have the compute called out on, on the first, on the top, mm -hmm. um, you know, like you, your servers, your VMs, your Azure, even K8S, app services, um, even the Amazon EC2 is being called out. So yeah, uh, you can, obviously this is not an exhaustive list, but mm -hmm. the main, the most common workload, if you will, that people are using today. So that's for the compute side, the service layer, 
um, DNS and, and uh, key wall that Chris kind of already called out. So uh, you have the network layer and uh, the API gateway, which is very, very common now, right? Like, because everybody's so focused on the API gateway now because it makes it life so easier that it, that becomes an easy target for law uh, hackers and uh, people are finding exploitations on there. Uh, and lastly, databases, we can never get away with creating more data in the world. So <laughs> um, that, uh, is pretty much where all the data goes, you know, like we were talking about earlier about uh, 23 and me, and um, it's the, they're going to have a database and where the data is going to be stored. And uh, you're going to find out, hey, how are they storing data and whatnot? And that data has to be protected. Before it used to be on NASes and SANS on prem, but now it's all in the cloud. So you have to protect somehow. Good stuff. All right. So. And these are the challenges that customers are going to go through. So, you know, public repos with, with vulnerability, there's going to be exploitation, and then you can find the vulnerability. And then once that comes in, that's over uh, there. And then because it was misconfigured, so as you can see, the database was misconfigured. And, and actually, this reminds me of um, a couple of times when people on the AWS side, they set up the S3 bucket, it's um, visible to the world and people are like, oh, I, f I found this file because it was never <laughs> secured and that file was never supposed to be. Public endpoints. <laughs> so uh, we've heard those stories many times now. It's not, that's not, yeah, so. And that's where this really comes in. And then as you can see with infrastructure as code assessment, you're seeing where the vulnerability lies. So you're pretty much capturing it um, in the process, right? And, and then you have the data aware posture management. So you're taking a look at the, what the data looks like, like the, from an input standpoint, where it's coming in and what, um, how it's gonna affect. So yeah, um, and then mal malware scanning for storage as well. So that's actually, you know, um, pretty good approach, if you will, because you're trying to check at, at every layer, uh, um, you know. So if you even look out here, it says DevOps security, then you have the cloud security posture management and the cloud workload protection. So each, each every stage you kind of have uh, going a check and say, yep, how does it look? Does it look okay? Do we have any issues? Uh, and, and then, Defender for Cloud has capabilities for all these three scenarios. So, yeah, the capabilities are amazing. Love it. Love it. Yeah, and I just, I look at this like trying to simplify in my mind, you know, the, I see deployment, your current management, and then your protection, ongoing protection. So, um, you know, three different buckets, which is awesome. And, you know, we've been in this field for quite a while, over 20 some years or so, and you know, it's like, all right, I had to stand up a VM and then I ran IS on it. Now I need to do all this other stuff. But this is this is amazing. It's like we can go and code it up and say, here, go manage all three of these things pretty quickly. So, exactly. Love it. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, with, with the Defender for Cloud, these are mainly, you know, kind of talked about this already, but then the three buckets that we talked about, it kind of breaks it down into more detail. Um, you know, the DevOps security management, how are you going to do that? How are you going to strengthen and manage your security posture? Because that's something uh, you need to have. If you don't, like, as they say, if, if you um, uh, don't have visibility, how are you going to manage it, right? So you need to have visibility uh, of your environment. Otherwise, there's no way you can manage it. So um, that's why the security posture on the uh, Defender for Cloud does an amazing job on the overview side and then detection as well, because you have to detect vulnerabilities uh, beforehand. Otherwise, um, you know, nothing is going to happen. So the funny thing is, if you look at an average breach, the bad actors were not there for days or hours right they were there for months sometimes years mm -hmm. just collecting data 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 so you gotta uh, detect things beforehand right away 
And then at the bottom, as you can see, it covers all uh, hyperscalers, AWS, Microsoft, and then Google, and then plus on-prem as well, obviously, you know, because a lot of enterprise customers, they're not going to have all their uh, environment in the cloud. So you need something also to cover the on-prem. And the good thing is it brings everything in one pane of glass. So uh, the challenge earlier we had is since cloud came on or in the early day inception days of cloud, cloud was only showing cloud ready uh, workloads and stuff. So people had to go back and take a look on to their on-prem environment and cloud. Now those lines are less blurry because you can just take one pane of glass and say, okay, not, not only show me multi-cloud, but also on-prem, and then I can manage that through easily. So um, yeah, it, it makes life easier. Plus the teams are also uh, not as much siloed as before. So before enterprise customers, they would be siloed into networking, storage, you know, ops teams. Now because of the cloud, because the roles you are doing that role because you have to set things up you have to set the infrastructure compute storage networking and then you might have to do devops you might have to do security so you are wearing multiple hats but that's the way the cloud works <laughs> yeah. and i'll just i'll wrap two comments on this one like that the on-premises piece and i it, it, there's a lot of talk about workloads so let's be clear and let's make sure that you know, identity is a big part of this too. So a lot of the identity tools so on premises, um, you know, is is huge. Um, so we're talking. I know we're talking Defender for Cloud, but Defender for Identity is play there too. So um, as part of that threat protection model, that's signals that are being fed up. Um, the other, again, I know you touched a little bit on it, but the automation. Automation is key. So you know, a bunch of these images here. We're talking like ServiceNow or Snow, whatever you may call it. You know, Slack, some of these other things. Um, let's be honest. I mean, we're humans. We need to sleep. We're not going to be up 24 seven, or at least most of us aren't up 24 seven, maybe a couple of us on this uh, session are, but, um, but you know, we want things to be automated as best we can. We want to make sure that, you know, things that can be handled, um, with an automated response can, can do just that. And it doesn't have to wake somebody up in the middle of the night. It doesn't require human hands to touch, um, can just kind of protect, the castle protect the you know the organization so um all good things you know make sure that you're investing time in those types of automation tools too so not great points yeah i agree um yeah we kind of all talked about the multi and hybrid protection so uh yeah with the apis you go in the uh, azure and then obviously with azure uh on-prem aws and google so those agents are going to bring all the data back and gives you one pane of glass. Mm -hmm. And I love the uh, the little call out to Azure Arc here too, um, which is just awesome tool. So yeah. awesome, awesome tool. If you get a chance awesome. to go research it, but yeah, um, you know, it, it doesn't just bring. Maybe some of you are all familiar with uh, you know extended servicing updates for older models of you know operating systems. So maybe. Fortunately, unfortunately, you've been forced into, you know, handling those in your environments. But um, that's, you know, only one offering for Azure Arc. So, you know, change management, all kind of other fun stuff. Uh, great tool. So please check that out. But yeah, it's, uh, again, it, you know, provides signals back up to the cloud and, you know, it helps you kind of holistically manage your environment and your workloads. And there oh, we go. Like, more yeah. about Arc. <laughs> That's what this uh, slide, yeah. Um, so we have a full slide on Azure Arc with two Chris points. It, it does a phenomenal job. So I'll, I'll let Chris speak on this one. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Because, yeah, I, I got a little ahead of myself, but that's fine. Um, the, the extension, super easy installation. There's a bunch of different approaches. You know, once you have a, a managed service identity set up, um, you have opportunity to script it. You have opportunity to run it on... Um, you know, pretty much any endpoint device. So it's not just limited to Windows. You can run on Linux, you can run it on, you know, some IoT components, um, Kubernetes, you know, K8, uh, whatever else. So, um, but it's awesome. Uh, relatively easy to set up. It takes a little while to just kind of ramp up and uh, what I consider call it baselining. There may be other terms and terminology around it, but uh, it just takes a little, you know, a little bit to kind of get, 
get in sync with the cloud and report stuff back. But then you have that ability to use rich tagging that, you know, we're all used to in, in, um, inside of Azure. Uh, we can manage our resources and then those all get kind of fed back into Defender for Cloud. So again, it's like, you know, we, we see all of that information coming back, that single control pane. Um, and the one thing I would say too, on top of it is, you know, we also have Admin Center as part of it too. So, you know, for those that are familiar with using Admin Center, whether on-premises in the cloud, inside of Azure, um, you know, that's something that you can kind of tap into as well. Um, gives folks just easy ability to go in, do some remediations, uh, handle the compliance needs and stuff. So, um, but yeah, huge fan, huge fan of Azure Arc and Azure Arc Jumpstart components. So, um, also handles HCI. So, for those that are running Azure Stack HCI, um, big fan of that as well. So, good stuff. Yeah, it's a conversation by itself. And then, uh, uh, with Arc, you know, you can do tagging, you can do policies, you can do RBAC. So, um, yeah, I can, we can probably have another session on R, just on <laughs> R. But yeah, amazing, amazing things. And then, lastly, you know, like I know Chris kind of touched on this already, but then res respond and auto automate. So, some of the things you can automate, um, and we kind of talked about this, right? Sent Sentinel, which is Microsoft Seam uh, mm -hmm. for Azure. Um, uh, you you can do Splunk, uh, you can do other things, and then even a lot of people aren't using. I know a lot of enterprises are using ServiceNow for their uh, IT yeah. SM tool, as a IT SM tool, right? So change management, whatnot. All the logs go there. They get action, whatnot. Um, and then uh, Azure Logic App, that, that's amazing as well. But yeah, uh, leverage these things. They're already there. Um, Obviously, some things might be out of the box. Sometimes things are not out of the box. You have to go and turn things on and then go play with it, depending on the environment, how complex it is. But um, there's no, I, I will say this, there's no short uh, of tools provided today. So uh, just learning and going and um, getting your hands dirty, you, you know, by all means, go for it. Awesome. All right. So thank you, viewers. Thank you for tuning in. in. Um, Abdul, thank you for your wisdom, for your insights. Um, for you know, I'll pat myself on the shoulder too. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, hopefully you all, you know, learned something useful here. Again, you know, um, happy to answer additional questions. Just reach out. Do you have our info from the beginning of the session? Um, again, thank you to... Um, to Dwayne um, and, you know, our friends in the cloud just running this, um, you know, this cyber back to school session and um, series of sessions for this month. So, um, Abdul, any parting words? No, thanks. Thanks, Chris, for uh, being part of this with me. And uh, hopefully uh, folks enjoy this. This was honestly really good for us because it was enjoy enjoyful for us yeah. to, because we did learn quite a bit in the process of for, for the presentation, but hopefully you learned something new um, as cloud is changing and moving fast. And yeah, um, reach out to us if you have any questions. With that being said, thanks so much. Have a good night, uh, good evening, good day.